Talking Animals on WMNF. Duncan Strauss. My guest today is Jody Whitaker, veteran animal advocate and founder and executive director of the Chicago Alliance for Animals, or CAA. CAA is a volunteer animal protection organization that reflects Whitaker's profound commitment and tireless efforts. CAA's highest profile victory was its campaign to ban horse-drawn carriages in Chicago, the third largest city in the U.S., in fact, this conversation recorded because fittingly a Chicago City Council meeting that Whitaker needed to attend directly conflicts with this Talking Animals broadcast. Unfolded into a discussion that might be labeled anatomy of a victorious major animal rights campaign. In detailed fashion, she recounted key elements of carriage ban camp of the carriage ban campaign. From the initial phase, she and a colleague completed it was too soft and ramped it up to the meticulous efforts to document the violations of the carriage operators, the challenges and delays involved with engaging the city council and persuading them to ultimately vote for the ban. It's an illuminating and inspiring narrative, and we discussed some other topics too, and I'll play back that conversation in just a moment here on Talking Animals on WNF. Coming up later in today's program, I'll speak with Marion Parham, co-founder and president of Florida Voices for Animals, the longtime local animal rights organization, an organizer of the Tampa Bay Veg Fest, an acclaimed event typically held in early November. Sadly, the chief reason Marion is joining us today is discussing is that owing to the impact of the hurricane in all kinds of ways, this year's Veg Fest has been canceled. But we'll look to the future and other Florida Voices for Animals plans when I speak with Marion Parham later in today's show on Talking Animals on WMNF. Right now, though, Let's hear my conversation with Jody Whitaker, again, founder and executive director of the Chicago Alliance for Animals, recorded Sunday. This is Jody Whitaker on Talking Animals on WNF. Let's welcome back to uh, Talking Animals, Jody Whitaker. Thanks for joining us on the show again, Jody. Thank you very much. So I've had the pleasure of speaking with you on the show uh, a couple of times over many years now, but the most recent of those was about four years ago, I guess. And I'm not inclined to assume that the folks listening right now recall or in some cases even heard that conversation. So I think it's okay. We'll review some fundamentals and then delve into some new topics and developments. So let's get started by you telling me the story of the Chicago Alliance for Animals or CAA, a little bit of like the history and mission. Sure, definitely. Uh, so Chicago Alliance for Animals formed in 2015, in May of 2015. And, uh, it was a group of us here in Chicago, and we wanted it to uh, this organization to be kind of a space for any uh, local organizations to work together on local campaigns. And uh, it was my suggestion that the, our first campaign strategy uh, be working on horse carriages because I felt that it was kind of an easy target. Of course. There are big issues out there like big agriculture and uh, animal research and animal experimentation. Uh, so we we kind of decided to work on horse carriages and horse, or I'm sorry, circuses, animal circuses. And uh, so oh, so the first good. issue was circuses. I'm sorry, not not horse carriages or no horse care. It was kind of horse, both horse carriages oh, and animal I circuses. See. Okay, I got so you. So if any circuses were coming to town, we would work on that. And uh, so we started protesting down at the horse carriage stand every month and we started reaching out to local uh, city council members and the mayor and that's how it started. And then uh, I can go into how it really, our campaign really went into what I consider overdrive and that's when we, we knew what we were doing. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, I guess uh, there's that kind of learning curve, you know, if if an organization's kind of in its formative stages and focuses on a campaign, and this one was obviously complicated and there's so much history and other stuff we'll, I'm sure, get into about horse-drawn carriages, wherever they still continue to exist and some of the resistance for people like yourself say, hey, that's really not the best thing for the horses, et cetera. So, yeah, why don't you just describe that? Because I guess I didn't realize from our other conversations that that was the very first campaign campaign. So that's quite a notable victory right out of the gate, as it were. Right. And so, like I said, we formed in May of 2015 and we started doing monthly monthly outreach where we'd stand down by the horse carriage stand, hand out flyers, talk to the public, hold signs, very peaceful uh, protests. And in August of 2017, my uh, my colleague Barbara Whelan Krantz and I were at the National Animal Rights Conference in Washington, D.C., and we were sitting at our booth and we were just it was kind of slow. And we were talking about our campaign and we we both decided that d- what we were doing was just not enough. We really had to pick up our game. And what we decided right then and there that when we got back to Chicago, we picked a date uh, and we went down to the horse carriage stand and we documented the horses from early morning until late at night. And every city has laws on the books regarding horse carriage trade. And Chicago had very clear laws. But what it comes down to, and this is pretty much true of every city, there are laws about how long the horses can work, how often they must be provided water, what temperature restrictions they can work at in the heat and the cold. And so we we looked over Chicago's code and we basically learned it by heart everything and there were there were all sorts of laws regarding the fact that they could not work if it was 90 degrees or hotter they couldn't work more than six hours in a 24-hour period there were certain streets they couldn't go down there's one street in chicago that's kind of a, a party area downtown and they weren't allowed to go on the street after i believe 6 p.m on friday night and they did it every time they would turn the corner on this street and every time nobody was watching it and we had to we had to keep looking at the law like are we reading this correctly because yeah. they would take they would leave the stand take a right on Chicago Avenue and take a right on Rush Street Rush Street is this little street that there's bars and you know yeah. a lot of nightlife Pretty and they famous would just take, for that yeah yeah t- take a right on Rush Street and every time they would take a right, we would just be standing there filming and saying, once again, they're going north on Rush Street. And that is against Chicago's laws. And after we would take do these long, sometimes 12 hour days, we'd get down to the horse carriage stand around 9, 10 in the morning. And we sometimes we'd be still there at midnight, 1 a.m. on Sunday morning. Wow. And uh, they the main thing we found out and we we sh- we made the the mayor and the city council very aware of is that they were only supposed to work six hours in a 24 hour period. They were working them from like 10 a.m. till midnight or till one in the morning. Wow. So more than double what the law allowed. And by documenting these violations and what what it takes to prove to your city council that they're breaking the law is you actually have to be down there. We would get down there and we would, when one carriage would roll up, we would take a video of the, of the horse, the driver, the number of the license plate. And we would say, you know, we'd narrate our video and say, here's antique coaching carriage number two, uh, arriving at 10 7 AM on August 17th. And we'd take a short 30 second, one minute video. And every time that horse would come leave for a ride and come back for a ride, drop off the passengers, we would take another quick video saying, here again is anti coaching carriage number two. They just gave a ride. And we would document that if they showed up at 10 a.m. and they were supposed to be off the street by uh, six. So I'm not doing the math in my head, but yeah. And we would say, you know, this horse should be going back to the stable right now. And, and they wouldn't. And then, you know, every hour we'd be like, this horse has now worked one hour longer than they are allowed to, two hours, three hours. And we would do that. We did this multiple times. And then we would send our footage to uh, the city council members and we would put out press releases. And when we, we got press on this in uh, after our first time, and that that really made a big difference. 
And were you and I guess it was probably just you and Barbara initially who kind of hatched this idea when you were at the uh, animal rights conference. And by the way, did you, you guys say, hey, we got to step up our game? Partly because you were influenced by some of the people that you had met and hung out with at that conference or what it just happened to be there coincidentally? Or was that part of what figured into your decision to uh, kick it up a notch or two? I mean, obviously, there are people at that conference who are doing amazing things and uh, people I've looked up to and heroes. But with this specific campaign, we just we just decided like one hour a month of this you know peaceful protest or educational outreach is what we called it yeah. was just not doing it. We yeah. knew that there were laws on the books and and really what it comes down to, and I, I say this because for anyone listening who wants to ban horse drawn carriages in their city or actually any issue, there's laws around surrounding that. But when it comes to animals, the laws on the books are rarely enforced, and it's up to animal advocates or compassionate people to make sure the laws are enforced. And so, for example, I'll give a perfect example. Um, on the 4th of July one year, it was hovering between 90 and 93 degrees. And I had a friend in town. We were going to go out and have a drink and have some fun. And I told him, I said, I have to go to the horse carriage stand because I knew it was around, you know, it was, it could be be 90, 91, 92. Yeah. I have to get down there because I'm sure there are horses working. And so we went down there and sure enough, I videotaped two or three horses working in 90 plus degree heat. And I, I called the police. Uh, the police never did anything. And that can be a deterrent, but you've got to still do it. So to your question, we just decided we have to figure out ways to show that they're breaking the law. And that that's yeah. how we did it. And we had other people help us with these day long kind of like uh, camp outs, you know, stakeouts. Right. <laughs> Were you incredulous, at least early on when you did spend those kind of full days there? How often there were one kind of violation or another of the rules as you, I mean, I, obviously you didn't like the idea that the horse drawn carriage to begin with, but it must have seemed initially like, I can't believe these guys are so flagrant in their disregard for, you know, how many hours the horses can be out there, how long totally they can be there, the heat temperature yep. issue. I mean, it just seemed like there would be one thing after another as you guys were just out there logging everything. It completely was. And when we started, the horse carriage operators would laugh at us. They would take video of us when we were videotaping violations. They would they would try to, I think, scare us or intimidate us by taking photos or videos of us. We had every right to be down there documenting violations of the law. What we were doing was not illegal, taking a video of them. And they would tell us things. And this is another thing that I say because I want others to be aware of it. If you witness a violation of the law, you have every right to take a video of it and document it and narrate your video. They could take a video of you. I mean, I don't really know all the laws, but by they want to intimidate you not to do that. Or And then other things they would do, and for example, they couldn't be on Chicago streets between 4 and 6 p.m. And between, I believe, 7 and 9 a.m., Monday through Friday, because that was those were rush out rush hours. OK, so they would leave the stable, which was about a half hour trot for the horse to get to the horse carriage stand where they would stand and pick up their rides and drop off their ride. And they would leave the sta their stables approximately around 530 p.m. to make their way to the stand at six. The way the law was written was they cannot be on the street between four and six p.m. So <laughs> I would go to the spot uh, by a bank right down the street from the stable and I would see them coming out around 5.30, around 5.40 and I'd get out my handy little cam, my phone and take a video and, and again say, here's a uh, cargo horse and carriage number four. Uh, they're on the street at 5.45 p.m. They are breaking Chicago's law. And they would say to me, we can be on the street now. We just can't be down at the horse carriage stand until six. No. Yeah. So they're, 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 they lie to our face. They sure. try to tell us you know, how the law works. And what it comes down to is it's up to you as an advocate to read the law and to, you know, if you're confused by it, reach out to the agency of that city and say, am I reading this correctly? Can they not be on any street in Chicago from four to six? Exactly. But they were telling us, they were telling us how it worked. Yeah. And what it came down to is they knew nobody ever monitored the trade and they were never fined or cited until we started doing it. And then guess what? They started getting cited and fined for these violations. And yeah. so when we would come around, they they started changing their ways. They stopped coming out of the stable until six 
Uh, and that was all due to the work of the Chicago Alliance for Animals. And because of us documenting these violations, as well as our educational outreach, as well as reaching out to our officials daily through our daily action alerts, and then uh, testifying before the city council. Those were like the main strategies that helped us uh, pass this in two and a half years. So impressive. And the thing that's great about it is really, again, that it was your first issue and you kind of, as many people have to do initially, you sort of just kind of find your way but there's no there's no path there's no prescribed thing what to do you just have to sort of say all right if we get there at this time we document this we make a video and then it just started to work yeah and, you know. and it's you know it's what is going on with now with my Lincolnwood campaign is i'm i remember in late of 2019 i felt very defeated by the horse carriage campaign we after we got the media exposure in August or September, and then again in December, we weren't getting meetings with with the city council members or the mayor. And this is an interesting story: is I we went out and documented the day, the Saturday after Thanksgiving, you know, and in the area where the horses worked where it was a very shop like a shopping district um, on Michigan Avenue. And so I was out there all day on that Saturday documenting horses being overworked. I'd been trying to get a meeting with one of the city council members whose district is where the horses worked. And uh, he would not return my calls, wouldn't meet with me. And the following Monday, I was at my my job that I got paid at. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I got a call from his office and the woman said, you know, there's no need to meet with him because he's not interested in introducing legislation to ban the horse carriages. And so I listened to her and then I said, OK, please tell him that this last Saturday I documented every single horse being overworked. Horses not provided water um, going down streets. They weren't allowed. And it was like empty air on the other side. Uh, end of the phone. And I said, so please pass this along to him and ask him to return my call. And I said, I'm putting out press releases in the morning about all of these violations. Well, we got a lot of media and I I never got that call from him. But within like a couple days, uh, we got, I got woke up to from a friend saying, can you believe it? And the Chicago Sun-Times ran an article about this specific city council member, uh, Riley, introducing a ban. <laughs> After... Oh. His aide told me he wouldn't. So it was never and never got back in touch with you at any point, not, not only to meet, but even to say, hey, just so you know, here's what I'm about to do. I mean, that's he just introduced it. <laughs> well, like, and, you had no role in it, I guess. Was that part of the idea? Was well, uh, I, uh, we had a very big role in it. Oh, so uh, in, in real right? life, he did. But I wonder if he was <laughs> thinking like if he can just slide this by and sort of take credit for you know, I, I, I didn't mind that he didn't call yeah. me back. He obviously did what we wanted by right. introducing that legislation. And if he could do it without, he didn't need to. And the way I look at it is he saw the media. He saw the, um, the footage of these horses being overworked. And so at that point he said, okay, enough. I'm going to introduce this legislation because, and you fast forward to, March 11th, 2020, which is the day that we got the bill finally out of the committee. He was there and he adamantly defended me and my organization and my volunteers. And he said, you know, I had no interest in doing this, but basically this organization proved that you do not self-regulate. He's talking to the horse carriage operators. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Self-regulate. The city doesn't have time to put babysitters on the street, you know, from 9, 10 a.m. on a Saturday or Sunday until midnight that night. So sure. he said, if you can't self-regulate, then you're going to, then the industry has got to go, go away. And that's literally, and that meeting was very powerful because after he introduced the legislation in December of 2018, we got it on the agenda the following September and we had enough votes to pass. And the chair of that committee stood up and blocked the vote. She blocked the democratic process. Mm. And because of that, we had to wait until March of 2020 because they wouldn't put it back on the agenda. And we were testifying at every city council member or I'm sorry, at every meeting, asking them to put it on the agenda. And it, it was getting held back from this chair of the committee of the committee where it was sitting, the license committee. And we also believe the mayor was was not allowing it to go forward. So it was it was very crooked. It was typical Chicago politics. But. I'm very proud of the fact that, you know, between us continually documenting violations, 
continually reaching out to the different city council members every day and then testifying before city council. We made it clear to them we're not going away. <laughs> we're going to keep proving how this this trade does not follow the law you and how the city refuses to enforce the law. And then they finally allowed it to go forward. Wow. Well, it's, yeah. a, it's a testimony to persistence and documenting things and People like yourself and fortunately, I guess others were willing to put in long, long days to capture exactly what the circumstances were and how flagrant those violations were so that the city council person who initially didn't have to give you the time of day, literally, uh, suddenly was uh, outraged. And um, but it just goes to show you there are certain things that you really need on a campaign, especially in a big city like Chicago, to to make, you know, to make the headway, to make the impact. Yeah, and I, I'll tell people there were days. I mean, I didn't enjoy going down to the horse carriage stand uh, at 9 a.m. on a Saturday, uh, and I remember taking one video of just the noise. I'm not. I love the the city of Chicago, but I'm not a shopper. I don't like really the Michigan Avenue scene. You know, it's very crazy. There's buses, garbage trucks, uh, speeding motorcycles, taxi cabs. Uh, you know, a lot of pedestrians, it's a very touristy area. And I remember once just taking a video thinking, this is what these horses have to deal with all day long, every weekend, this noise, this constant chaos. Yeah. And these are farm animals that are used to being in a pasture in a right. quiet area. And they have to listen to all this and be around it with blinders on. So, and I've got, we've got tons of videos of horses behind city buses, you know, breathing exhaust or right next to a garbage truck with their air horn that's so loud. And it's, I mean, for me, I was uncomfortable down there. I was getting stressed out and I can't imagine what these horses have to deal with. Uh, So if you're in a city that still has horse carriages, I'm happy to help you and guide you and give advice, but only if you're committed to doing it. There's it takes commitment and it doesn't mean you, you have to do it every, you know, every single day or, or tons of take tons of time out of your day, but you have to commit to a campaign and work on it and it, and you can do it. Yeah, We could do it in the third largest city that's has a very well-known kind of corrupt <laughs> reputation that anybody can do it. Yeah, no, it's, it's really a textbook example of exactly those things, just but but how, how, like you say, the commitment has to be there. People don't have to be there all day, every day, but you have to put in some time to document the things that are going to get the attention of people that are possibly going to shut it down eventually or get outraged themselves and get legislation going. So, uh, so let me just quickly say, this is Talking Animals on WMNF. I'm Duncan Strauss. My guest is Jody Whitaker, founder and executive director of the Chicago Alliance for Animals, or CAA. And we're just hearing about their initial huge victory shutting down the horse giant carriages in Chicago. And uh, this interview was recorded Sunday. So that's great that you're kind of offering that. I was curious to see if in the wake of that victory, have you heard from people from from different cities or countries even that have horse drawn carriages saying, "Hey, how did you do it? Is there a blueprint for your for your campaign, or or can you help us?" Yeah, definitely. Uh, I I say that 2017 is the year where a lot of things clicked for me. That's when we decided to uh, start going down to the horse carriage stand and picking up our game and and looking at other strategies like testifying before city council, coming up with business endorsement pledges, all sorts. You know, it takes one thing might not work for other cities. So it, what I believe is, you know, throw everything at the wall, try everything because you never know what's going to reach a specific uh, elected official or a mayor of of that city. So um, it was in, I believe, October of 2017 when I formed the partnership to ban horse carriages worldwide. And that I, I scoured social media for anybody in any other city working on similar bands. And I found a lot of people uh, and I reached out to people in Philadelphia, New York City, um, Houston, Dallas. Uh, um, and so I started we had a, a secret, uh, if you will, Facebook thread, Facebook page for, for people in other cities. Uh, and once we banned our horse carriages, I'd made that public because I thought, you know, I need I need as many people to join and help with these campaigns. There's no point in keeping it like just amongst the organizers. And so I did end up forming uh, 
banned horse carriages chapters all over the world. We have very active campaigns right now in Dallas, in Charleston, in Savannah. Uh, I have chapters in Boston, New York City, Krakow, Poland, uh, Indianapolis, uh, New Orleans. <laughs> I keep wow. thinking of many yeah. Um, unfortunately, uh, I've had I've guided people and then they kind of fall by the wayside and they just stop working. And, and it's very frustrating because, you know, it's, I tell people like, you don't have to put in, you know, three hours a day or anything. I, I recommend people put in one hour a week and that's doable. I mean, there's 24 yeah. hours in a day, but, yeah. but don't, don't give up because if you give up, you definitely won't win. You won't get there. But if you continually put in a little time and work toward your goal, you'll get there. I mean, again, I didn't enjoy those long days, but I did it because I did it for the horses. And I also, you know, like I said, on the 4th of July, did I really want to go down the horse carriage stand and see horses standing in direct sunlight with no water? No, because it's hard on me. It's hard emotionally, but I had to do it because I knew they were there. And and I did it. And I, I didn't spend all day there. I, I went down. I made my my videos. I called the police. I made a had a record that I called the police to make sure the city knows, OK, on this day, on the 4th of July, the horses were being worked in too hot a weather and uh, things like that. You got to do. And uh, and if you care, I think you'll stick with it. So I I encourage everybody to stick with these campaigns. And I'm always here for anybody who's willing to to, you know, work with me on it and i have the i have the i think i have a lot of the strategies that work <laughs> well apparently so yeah <laughs> for sure so uh quick question about so you mentioned a number of cities and i guess one that sort of famously has been at, at the kind of high profile part of this is new york city uh, how do you feel that's going for any kind of advancement along the lines of what you guys have eventually got done in chicago is that, is that just too ingrained in some various cultural and other elements there in that city? Or do you think there's still a chance of, of a ban there? New York definitely has a chance. And I, I'm very frustrated that it, they haven't done it yet. Yeah. Uh, they, obviously, New York is a bit bigger trade than Chicago was or, or than most cities. But yeah. I don't know. I know that they've gotten a lot of celebrities to speak for them. But I don't know if they're doing like the documenting of, you know, like going out at nine, 10 in the morning and, and doing wow. what we did. Uh, I know people working on that cam- campaign. I've urged them to do this. I don't know. They may be, they may not be, but I've never seen it. And yeah. you've got to prove, I, I can't stress this enough, is you've got to prove that they're being overworked. Uh, I know New York has a law. I don't know off the top of my head because I haven't worked on New York in a while, but I think it's might be nine hours that, that they can work the horses. Like Chicago's was six, so it's different. But I, I bet you they're working those horses more than nine hours. Uh, and with the deaths, with the collapses in New York, I don't know why it's not being done. I understand yeah. that they've got they've got union behind the, the horse carriage operators have unions and that that's a big uphill struggle. But when you've got video of horses being whipped on the street and trying to get the horse up, uh, uh, I can't think of the horse's name off the top of my head, but uh, that in itself should have been enough to ban them right outright. So yeah. I, I don't honestly know what's going on and why it's taking so long in New York. It's very frustrating to me, uh, but I'm, I'll am i help in any way I can. If I see the group putting out actions, I will do those actions. I'll call the mayor, mayor, uh, uh, <laughs> forgetting his name too, but uh, he's an embattled mayor now. But yeah. I'll yeah. I'll do any of those actions. But it's really up to the locals who to keep working on it. And you know, celebrity endorsements are important, but that's not as important as contact having people contact the city council and the mayor every day and, yeah. and testifying before them and documenting violations. Right, and sometimes you, of course you have celebrity endorsements going the other direction. Like I remember Liam Neeson, for example, and some right. others. Uh, and there was a key editor at the New York Times a bunch of years ago who wrote like a whole thing about this. So so you're up against a lot of different factors. But like you say, strip all that away. If you can document what the treatment of the horses is or the mistreatment of the horses, that's how you get people's attention. And that's how you can make some progress, it sounds like. Right. And and I think uh, I think, you know, getting down there and taking a 30 second video, you know, here and there is is great. But it's not as good as being down there the entire day. Because yeah. that's how you show, uh, you know, like I said, we would take a video at 10 a.m. And when that horse would come back from a ride, we'd take another video. So it's showing the public, this horse is still here. 
you know, and every hour or every half hour, you take another quick video of that horse to kind of show how long these horses days are as yeah. opposed to just one video of a horse in the street. So again, I'm not following that campaign because I'm here in Chicago, but I will help in any way I can. And I hope they, I hope they get their ban soon. I mean, it should have been done years ago. Yeah. And I hope, I hope it, they get their ban soon because those horses need to need sanctuary and they need to get out of out of uh, that sure. environment yeah well one of the things along these lines then we'll get into some other topics altogether but maybe you could talk for a moment about electric carriages and what they might have done to transform the issue i remember reading a uh i think it was a new york times piece maybe a couple months ago about a longtime horse-drawn carriage uh, operator in brussels who had decided to sell his five horses and he put the, the money that he generated from that i guess towards buying two electric carriages and they documented in this story at least that a couple months in business was booming people loved the carriage w without the horse and just loved the experience and he planned to buy a third electric carriage so it seems like there's something there to lessons to, uh, to be learned the other way about people aren't clinging to the horse part of it necessarily if you have something still looks cool and interesting as the carriage itself but it's electric powered instead of horse powered you know i personally i don't think they're necessary if a a company that used to use horses wants to transition. I applaud it in every way, shape or form. Yeah. Um, some cities like in Chicago, it, it really didn't come up because we weren't pushing for electric carriages because sure. we have enough traffic in the city of Chicago. Right. That, yeah. You know, and, and and but if it takes that to get a ban, I'm all for it. You know, in Philly, I worked with uh, my partners uh, Stephanie Kerson and um, Tiffany Steer, and who now are working hard on Revolution Philadelphia, and they're doing great work. But I had helped guide them on a campaign in Philly, and they got the horses off the street. So I'm thrilled about it. Um, I hope they get an actual ban soon. W what the holdup is, is that their city council member is saying he won't allow a ban until they get electric carriages, which is kind of silly, because there's no horses on the street right now. Nobody's like, you know, clamoring for horse, horse drawn carriages. Yeah. And so, you know, if they have to get electric carriages in order to get that official ban, because my concern is that if New York does ever get their horse carriage ban, that some of the operators and owners might transition to say Philly or Boston. And mm. Boston, Boston hardly has a horse carriage presence, but the streets in Boston, I lived in Boston for three years. The streets in Boston are, you know, those are old streets, cobblestone. Some areas are cobblestone. The last thing they want or need are horses having to navigate that kind of, you know, those kind of streets. Yeah. And yeah. so I want these cities, even if they don't have a horse carriage present presence now, to continue to work on getting the legislation passed because, you know, we don't want New York to start going to some of these other cities. Yeah. And so again, if, if that, if they need the electric carriage in order to get the ban, then I, uh, like I said, I'm all for it, but I don't think that should be advocates main push. I think right. the main push would, should be that, you know, horses are not vehicles. Uh, they shouldn't be exploited like they are in this trade. Right. And then, of course, the fact that every every horse carriage operator breaks the law. I'm sure of it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, you have some uh, pretty direct uh, experience with that realm. So, um, yeah. yeah, but that's interesting how the electric carriages in a way have actually become kind of a complicating factor where some of the things that you heard and read, you know, suggest like it's a solution. But it sounds like it's a mixed bag in terms of moving forward with this, at least in certain cities or countries. There I, I believe they're expensive. I mean, again, if, if they help the horse carriage owner or operator say, yes, I'd rather, you know, transition to this e-carriage, then I am all for it. But if if they can't, or a lot of times the horse carriage uh, proponents will say, nobody wants an e-carriage. The whole point is having that horse there and feeling in touch with this animal. Well, you know, being in touch with that animal who's wearing blinders and who's got a bit, a painful bit in their mouth, that's not like spending time with a horse in nature where they can be themselves. Yeah. They're, so it's... Uh, so e-carriages for me are, you know, I, I, I don't know, I've got a mixed emotions about it, sure. but, but basically what it comes down to is if, if it helps a city get a ban or then I, I say, go for it. 
Okay, I got you. If you so, don't need them, um, you know, like in Chicago, it never really even came up, you know. Uh, and I, I think that it, well, I think it did come up on March 11th at that final meeting when we got it passed out of the license committee. And yeah. I believe the two aldermen in the area where the, you know, that where the horses work, the two that introduced the legislation, they said something to the effect of, we don't need more you know, vehicles on the street, especially slow moving vehicles, which is another complaint in a big city is you've got people trying to get to work. You've got buses trying to drop people off and they have to slow down behind a horse carriage. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, I guess we'll kind of keep an eye on what's happening in New York and elsewhere, but, uh, but it sounds like you're a great resource for people who, who are serious about those efforts. So that's good to know. Again, this Definitely. is talking- I, I- no, I was just going to say, this is Talking Animals on WNF. I'm Duncan Strauss. I'm speaking with Jody Whitaker, founder and executive director of the Chicago Alliance for Animals, in an interview that was recorded Sunday. So I don't want to run out of time to hit some other stuff here, uh, Jody. So let's talk a little bit about other kind of main campaigns for CAA right now, what, what you're focused on, and um, what we should know about that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, our main campaigns right now are to uh, free spur a tortoise from uh, – a three by five prison that she's been in for more than 30 years. She was trafficked from her home and family in Africa and has, uh, has been in this pet store called the animal store in Lincolnwood, Illinois, which is on the North side of Chicago, Northwest side. And we alerted the village officials to this issue. And they actually have a law in their books that prohibit the keeping of wild animals. And so we've been urging them to, enforce this law. And back in March of 2022, they voted to waive their own law. And by doing so, it's keeping this amazing animal it, it stuck in a, a, you know, three by five display case where she cannot roam. She cannot, uh, she can't do anything natural. She doesn't get to feel sunshine on her shell or a breeze or live outside or have companionship with others of her kind. And it's, it's very, it's a sad situation. We have a, a sanctuary for her in Arizona called Desert Oasis Turtle and Tortoise Sanctuary, where mm. she would ha- be able to live as natural a life as possible. She'd be able to burrow and roam. They're yeah. slow animals, but they like to roam, and she can. Uh, wow. So what prospects do you think at this point of uh, that being rectified? Well, I think we're going to win. It's just taking time, and it's taking right. too long, in my opinion. Uh, this village uh, trustees, the board, is is very corrupt in my opinion uh the mayor does not want to hear from us we've been testifying at almost every single meeting and we keep going and we won't stop until spur is at dots in arizona and they stop selling rabbits there's a cook county law that prohibits the sale of rabbits from pet stores lincolnwood is part of cook county they have opted out of this law since it passed back in march of 2016 i believe so for more than eight years, the village has opted out of this rabbit law and all the local rabbit shelters and rescues are inundated with rabbits. Mm. And this store sells baby rabbits that are not neutered, they're not altered, and they're not vaccinated. Okay. So so people go and buy rabbits at Easter or whenever, and then they realize that rabbits are not the easiest pet. They like to chew on electrical cords. Uh, They're considered exotic. You can only take them to an exotic vet. Um, And then they get sick of them or they think, oh, this animal is more expensive than I planned. And so they either dump them on these animal rescues uh, and shelters that never have enough homes, never have enough fosters, uh, never have enough cages, or they put them outside. They just drop them in a forest preserve or a parking lot, thinking that this domestic animal knows how to survive on its their own, and they don't. So the village of Lincolnwood is uh, incredibly irresponsible, and we tell them all the stories, the horror stories of these rabbits and what Spur deals with, and they are unmoved. Mm. So we keep pushing. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, sometimes if it's just a single animal like that, it seems like it should be more poignant and powerful rather than like just like some sort of uh, unidentified group or or combination animals or breeds or whatever. But sometimes it just seems more heartbreaking when it's just this one tortoise who's just looking to live like they should, like a natural life. This is a wild animal uh, who has nothing natural to her world. 
when we first started documenting Spurs situation back in uh, uh, October, November 2021, she would climb up on the side of her enclosure. And it's, it's like tiled. It's almost like bath tile. And she has these big claws and she would try to climb up and she would fall. And she would hit her face or her chin on the side of, of this cage. And then if I walked to the other side, she would walk over and try to get out. And for the last year, we don't even see her move. She is lethargic. Right. She doesn't. The owner told one of my volunteers that she has a respiratory infection. Mm. And and so she said, well, could that be because she never gets sunshine? That she never gets to feel a breeze? That she doesn't have companionship? Yeah. Of course, he got angry with her and hung up on her. The owner of the store is a, is a real character. I'm sure. Yeah. Character is probably very diplomatic, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jody, uh, sort of nearing the end of our time here, unfortunately, I have a bunch more things I want to talk to you about. But it just sounds like some of these things are just take so much time. Well, how many hours in a given week would you say you devote to your your various enterprises and there's not just caa but there's other things it just seems like you've got your hands in so many things but some of those aren't aren't an actual job job as you alluded to earlier so what, what are we looking at for an average number of hours per week for this kind of work well i do this i do it full time now so um i would say anywhere between maybe 50 and 60 hours i put in yeah uh, there are times where, you know, I'm sitting at my desk all day working on animal, you know, animal issues. And if I'm not, you know, at work, home working on it, I'm at a meeting for, to testify downtown. We're also trying to ban the sale of new fur in Chicago. There's an ordinance that we're trying to pass. We're also trying to free Rocky the coyote, who's been stuck in a cage for more than six years, mm. who is a pack animal who has no companionship. Um, and then I find myself at night sitting on the couch and I might be watching TV and I'm on my phone <laughs> and I'm, you know, making calls for my partner in Dallas, uh, my part, uh, Gloria Raquel Carbajal, uh, Sherry Burling, Burling, Burling Game Pressman in Charleston, who's trying to ban horse carriages there. They're doing great work. So I'm helping them and I'll, I'll make the calls and send the emails or to reach out to their city council members. So, um, it's, you know, I, I, I put a lot of time in, but that doesn't mean I don't have time for uh, fun, too, because that's important. Yeah, so that's really good, because I was going to say, as, as a longtime activist doing this for a number of years, just seems like a concern for those people like yourself who really work hard and have been doing it for a long time and are super committed. There's always a concern about burnout and about getting discouraged or worse. And uh, But you sound like you're aware of that and sort of taking steps to make sure that you have some kind of balance, some kind of fun in your life so you don't fall prey to some of those things. Right. I mean, the last thing, and there are times that I can get very down, depressed, and and discouraged, especially with this uh, Lincolnwood campaign and Rocky. These two campaigns are taking way too long. These are two animals we have sanctuary for, and these elected officials just seem to have no heart. So it's it can be very hard, but I have to just remember that legislation of any type is not quick. And when it comes to animals, it's even slower. It's, you know, and so I feel very lucky that we ban the horse carriages in two and a half years. This spur campaign is taking longer than that, and it shouldn't. Isn't that but, um, it's, it's so counterintuitive, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> if they just, they have a law on the books. They have two laws. If they simply enforced them, it would allow this animal to get to sanctuary. It would stop a little bit of the rabbits being dumped outside and being abandoned to fend for themselves. So, but they're just, they're like, we can choose to enforce this law or not. Obviously, these laws were proposed and passed for a reason, with for good reason. So, yeah, it's, uh, but, you know, when I get down like that, I try to think of new campaign strategies and always reaching out to the media. We, you know, I'm hoping to get some media on both campaigns. We got media on Rocky last week after I testified uh, before the Cook County Commissioner. So that was really oh, good. Yeah. Great. Well, Jesus, if uh, you don't have enough going on. So in your vast amount of free time now, you're also hosting a weekly radio show called If Cage Walls Could Talk. So tell me, we just have about a minute or so left, I guess, at this point. I'm sorry to say, but tell me a little bit about it. How did it come about? And uh, does it aim to fill a certain niche in particular? Well, I, I, it's called If Cage Walls Could Talk, and it's just all about any animal issue uh, that I can find. You know, I really like talking to people who are in grassroots 
doing the work that you know we do uh, and really showing that they're trying to make a difference for animals. So it's every Saturday from five to six central time. And uh, uh, if it's a great, I think it's a great show talking about all sorts of animal rights issues and how to liberate animals from suffering and pain. And how do you like doing it? It sounds like you're really enjoying it. I like it. Yeah. I mean, it's work because you're going to find guests. You understand yeah, I was this. Say, my hat's totally off you because I put like a crazy number of hours into this show, both before and after the broadcast, as I'm sure you've become all too familiar but I'm not doing the thousand other things that you're doing. So, I mean, you must be a master of time management is all I can say. <laughs> take this on on top of everything else you're doing. So, yeah, I don't know about that, but uh, it's, uh, it's trying as a balance, I guess, a balancing act. <laughs> yeah. Well, good for yeah. you. And it sounds like it's going well. And uh sounds like you've got some really good guests and uh, more to come, I'm sure. Yeah. And I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to me today. Oh, yeah. Well, no, it's great. And so we've been speaking with Jody Whitaker. And again, it's Chicago Alliance for Animals and other organizations that she founded and is involved with that we didn't even have a chance to talk about, including Center for Ethical Sciences and some of the things that we've talked about in the past. And uh, there's all kinds of stuff on and you, you can just search for Chicago Alliance for Animals and uh, there's uh, social media pages and websites and all kinds of stuff to get more information that we just didn't get a chance to cover today. So, Jody, thank you so much for joining us again on Talking Animals, and thank you for all your great work on behalf of all our animal friends. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time and interest. For sure. My thanks again to Jody Whitaker for joining us today on Talking Animals. And, and a uh, rare move, we're going to skip the uh, comedy corner for today so we uh, can get right into our conversation with Miriam Parham, who's the co-founder and president of Florida Voices for Animals. And uh, among other things, they are the organizers of the Tampa Bay Veg Fest, which, as I mentioned earlier in the show, unfortunately, hurricane impact of one kind or another has required them to cancel this year. So we're going to discuss that and more with uh, Miriam Parham. I'm going to bring her on the phone right now to do just that. Miriam? Hi, Duncan. Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks for joining us on uh, Talking Animals again, although I'm sorry what the circumstances are in this case. So, um, so uh, you know, we've been sort of talking a little bit on the show once or twice so far that the uh, Tampa Bay Veg Fest did have to be can- canceled owing to various aspects of the storm. Kind of give me, uh, if you will kind of a little more detail about the circumstances that led to what I'm sure was an agonizing decision to cancel the festival. Sure. I also want to thank Talking Animals and WMNF for your unwavering support through the years. Um, There's so much to share. I'll probably speak fast. We won't have time to cover everything, but this is a heartbreaking decision not to have our 13th annual Tampa Bay Vets Fest, which would have been scheduled, as you said, this Saturday. But the impact of the two hurricanes was tremendous to our community, to all areas, many vendors, many um, volunteers, our staff, and we hurt for the community. We're hurting like so many in the community, and pretty much all our board members, and um, if I skip anybody, all of the stuff is on our website, but our, you know, our board and our advisory board, and again, after speaking to many of them who sustained damage from one or both of the hurricanes to either their houses, their cars, both, you know, a lot of tree damage and just a lot of flooding, storm surges, this affected directly many of our board members who are living in the area of the Tampa Bay area as far down as Sarasota where Helene first hit and in the coast and, you know, one of our board members is close to losing her home and, um, Several volunteers lost cars. So same thing we've heard and seen from the community. So this is a labor of love and so many volunteers and sponsors. And our sponsors have been tremendous. Most of them have said we'll keep the money till next year for all the sponsorship and everything that, y'all, that you know many of the sponsors give us in, in return for um, doing this event. Um, this is an award-winning event. We were selected by the community for the past two years in a row for the Tampa Bay Times Best of the Best, one of the best, best festivals in the area. So we know this is something that means a lot to people, but it is a passion for us because it is an opportunity to support our community, many local restaurants, local businesses, professionals. We had several local um, health professional speaking this year, and uh, one of our board members, advisory board, Melissa Cepeda, who was on your show talking about Say No to Two, Yeah, that's still something that's fresh because she would have explained even more to anybody who had questions before the vote because it's a misleading amendment. So 
just quickly, she was going to talk about saying no to two to that. And again, had a, a beautiful speaker lineup, musicians, local musicians, and, and um, you know, um, chefs, oh my gosh, chefs from the community trying to support our wonderful, wonderful vegan restaurants like La Setima, um Club um, had their dish, Dave, their chef, that was going to make something for us that was yummy, and another restaurant who closed and reopened, Nana's Rooted. You know, we do this because we want our community to have plant-based options and not just the health but the benefit to animals and the environment. But in the past two years, Duncan, nine and actually recently a tenth vegan restaurant closed. This is heartbreaking. So we want to support these um, wonderful vendors and restaurants who worked so hard, got through the pandemic, and some didn't make it like many other, you know, businesses, too. So this is usually a celebration of happiness and just, you know, so much, you know, music. A kids' area, our, our organizer for the kids' area, her house was flooded. Oh, our, our, you know, um, food samples, our, our con- coordinator was adversely affected and the speaker's organizer, you know, yeah. name after name and story after Yeah, it just sounds like it just was left and right. You guys were just hit in all kinds of ways and there just wasn't a way to carry on. And we should mention, when you mentioned earlier about the local recognition, that some years ago, uh, Tampa Bay Veg Fest was uh, kind of acclaimed nationally as a one of the top veg fests in, in the country. Yes, One Green Planet said we were one of the top ten to attend. Yeah. Even the Tampa Downtown Partnership has recognized this as a family-friendly restaurant um, event and in the community. And so we really, really appreciate all that. And we just put our best and so many volunteers. So people say, well, why don't you move forward and have it? You know, when about half of our key, or if not all of them, had some impact, it's pretty hard to just, yeah. you know, you, you can't do that. You can't check in vendors and know who's supposed to do what, and you can't just organize and set up an event with people that you know are not involved throughout the year, working really hard to coordinate these areas. It's just for sure. It's did, just a lot to it. Did you give any thought, uh, even in passing, to like having a scaled back version of VegFest or, or a different uh, event that still well, retains some elements of it? Well, the cost for the park and the city and everybody was very, very gracious, but the cost without I, I just don't even know how you would scale it down, yeah. you know, have who can come and who can't come. It was very, very time-consuming just even um, sort letting through. people know, informing them of yeah. this. And I still have a couple of phone calls to make for people just to make sure they don't show up just as a volunteer. Or not not yeah. volunteer, but even as an attendee, my friends and family, like a lot of people. So, um, yeah, but one group, and we, we thank our friends and supporters from Vegan International. They do the Vegan Halal Cart, and they were going to be one of our vendors. They have a small little event that they're that we put up and posted also on our social media at We Vegan Cafe mm-hmm. in Manhattan that they're going to do on on um, Saturday from 11 to 5. Of course, they don't have you know all the vendors and, and the space and everything, so they probably couldn't accommodate the thousands of people that would come to our... Right, but if people are looking for something... You know, in lieu of the actual real McCoy happening this year, which you just can't for reasons you've explained, this would be an alternative. It could be. And fright, uh, I just want to mention, because you wanted me to mention going forward some things that we're doing. Cause we yeah, we, we just want to we have a, probably another minute, minute and a half, so I just want to make so sure you hit whatever you... Quickly, we have yeah. a karaoke potluck Friday night that we have every first Saturday at the Unitarian University, Universalist Church where we do our Thanks Vegan, which will also take place later on this month. And um, that's a potluck, and the details will be posted shortly on the website. The karaoke is already posted. We do quarterly park cleanups, and we, you know, volunteer work days at rescues. We had to, to cancel one at Laughing Pig Sanctuary because of the damage from the storm and concern with safety for our volunteers. And we will do our 30th annual Have a Heart for the Animals. It's also a yearly event in February. So we recognize all the volunteers and workers, but I just want to make sure that I don't remiss in saying Please, please, please support these vendors. If you go to our website for TampaBayVegFest.com, all our vendors were listed. We are leaving that deliberately, and we're going to maybe add more information and make sure there's links to their websites because just like those 10 restaurants that have closed in the past couple of years, we want to support our vendors. We want to make sure that you know they're out there and everybody needs to be supported. So please, 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 um, you know, 
do take out, do whatever. Okay. You can support our, our thank business. you. Thank you so much, Mary. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but I, I'm okay. so thank sorry you so about much. Yeah, but we covered quite a bit of ground, so I appreciate okay. it. And I'm so sorry. We'll see you next year at VegFest. Thank you so much, Duncan. This is Talking Animals on WMNF, and stay tuned for the conversation with Mario Nunez and Joe King Carter. Next week, we have Peter Singer.